Hello, welcome to The Next Level. I'm JVL here with my best friends, Sarah Longwell and Tim Miller of The Bulwark. And Tim is having a day. So this show is going to be a wild ride. Let's go do it. Uh, in the meantime, hit the subscribe button. Hit the thumbs up. Give us five stars. Leave a review. All those things. The things are good. And then go to thebulwark.com and sign up to get all the great stuff we do there. Because I don't want to... You know what? I'll just say it. I have been on fire for weeks now. And uh, the, the you know when we did this show last week, I was getting a talking to about how I did not understand the way of the world and that these congressmen act out of peak and they just don't want to stay in town on a Thursday night. And I said, I don't know. I have done my game theory matrix analysis of this, and I believe that Kevin McCarthy is likely to be speaker. Were you getting a talking to? I don't, I, don't, I don't recall you getting a talking to. I think that we had a disagreement about the the likelihood of the scenarios, but I don't I don't remember lambasting you. Uh, Sarah, say it. Say no, the catchphrase. I, I also didn't lambast you, and I did talk about the fact that physically sitting there becomes a thing, and it did, and it helped Kevin McCarthy secure the speakership. But JVL. You are occasionally right, and this is one of those occasions. Congratulations to you on being correct that Kevin McCarthy would eventually make it happen. He did. Thank and you. We're, and, we're, and we're happy for him? Is that where we landed? I mean, we're happy for me. That's that's the, the key <laughs> point of this is we're happy for me because I got to take a victory lap on this. I will say, did you see the pictures of Kevin McCarthy standing under the wooden sign with his name and pointing at it like, like goofy or something. And I thought to myself, aren't you supposed to act like you've been there or something like this? It was a very weird meta moment where it was like, yup, I'm the guy who's always been desperate to be speaker. And I got it. Look. There was a video. I don't know if you saw this video. I'm glad you mentioned this JBL. Cause I thought I was the only one to know to men to notice this. And you know, sometimes I feel like I'm just being a little too hard on old Kevin on Twitter, et cetera. And that, you know, I've got Kevin derangement syndrome or whatever, and that I need to dial it back. So I didn't tweet about this. But uh, in that same video where he's pointing up, one thing I noticed is he he, he finishes, he, t he points up for the professional cameras, like the cameraman, mm -hmm. CNN, AP, whoever is there. And then he takes his phone out of his pocket and he goes and hands it to maybe a staffer, <laughs> maybe one of the reporters. And then has them take a picture from his phone of him pointing up at the thing. So, like, I guess he can have it on his own device. I, I felt like that was a little tacky. I don't know. I mean, I, like, I thought that there was, uh, I mean, Jeb, we make fun of Jeb for kindly requesting that the audience clap <laughs> for a joke that he made for, like, seven years now. And, uh I, it seems equally desperate, at least, at least, at minimum, equally desperate to, like, want people to get photos of you pointing up at your sign. I hate to break this to you, but Kevin got the thing he wanted. Jeff yeah. did not. Well, and, and here's the thing. Whatever us cucks and naysayers and liberal <laughs> media traders say, uh, he's got it for forever. There is a page on on the congress.gov oh, and in Wikipedia with the names of all of the speakers of the House of this Republic of ours. And Kevbo's name is etched in there for history. It's like winning the Super Bowl. They can never take I, it away from us. But don't so Liz remember. Truss. Liz Truss, too, is, was prime minister. And she'll go down as, what, the prime minister that lasted the least amount of time. Kevin is... Speaker, until one of these clowns does the motion to vacate and wins it. Yeah. Also, I guess I just, you know, in the in the broad scope of history, you know, um, it's amazing how much things get forgotten. I, one of the one of the things, one of my observations during the whole speaker drama was how few speakers I, I know, and I'm like, you know, in politics. Right. I mean, when they were talking, when you're going down the list of the guys who had the longest votes and you had like Paul Gillette and, you know, like whatever, Bob Crockett or whatever from the 1800s. And you're looking at those names. You had to die Springfield. Yeah. yeah. And it was just like, so I get, you know, I don't know. And I guess in theory, Bob Gillette's great, great grandson can go to the Capitol and point up at the thing, you know, and they can then 
tell their kid who's in second grade on a tour of the Capitol, be like, that's great, great granddaddy Paul. He was the speaker there. And then the kid's like picking his nose, like looking, you know, looking at his, looking at his pop, wondering when he can go to the gift shop to get a Paw Patrol. I don't, I mean, I guess there's something to it, but the speaker of the house, it's not like president speaker of the house. And there've been, you know, people well, don't know him. Second in line to the presidency. Yeah, he's second in line. I don't think we should. I don't think we need. I mean, how many how many speakers do you know? Let's have a competition, live competition. How many speakers <laughs> can you name? In I don't history? think I can name more than five. Trent Sarah, can you name more than five? The Trent Lott Trent Lott was a senator, Senate Majority Leader. Oh, for one, Sarah's okay. off. Sarah, you're uh, you okay. are lost. Jim Newt Gingrich. Gingrich. Jim Jim Wright. Uh, Newt Gingrich. Denny Paul, Haster, John Paul Boehner, Ryan, John Boehner, Paul Ryan, uh, Nancy Pelosi. Uh, oh, who do we Democrats have back too? in the? Who was the? There was a Democrat who was defeated. Was Haster ever speaker? Never a right. Speaker? He mentioned Haster, but is, is that like one of those national championships that gets stripped from you after it comes out that you're a pedophile? <laughs> like you get the title stripped from you? He's like the John Calipari of speakers. Uh, Tip O'Neill, uh, you didn't mention, but can we name one? Oh, yeah, the tipster. Name one? There was another, Tim? like after Jim Wright, there was, an, there was another, or after Tip O'Neill, another Democratic speaker who lost uh, a re-election fight. I'm Has Nancy Pelosi been is. speaker since Tip O'Neill? No. Yes. No. <laughs> what do you mean? No. Man, what, you Tip, Tip O'Neill was a million years ago. You know, all those Republicans in between, the first Democrat. No, I'm and saying Conrad Democrat. Muhlenberg. Yeah. There was okay, Conrad okay. Muhlenberg. Everybody remembers Connie. He was the oh, first speaker old, of the house. Old the mule, as we called him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway. Okay, I just I don't think we need to self soothe. Did I win this competition no, too? No, no, <laughs> you, I don't you think we need it. to self soothe on Kevin. Kevin got the speakership. Uh, we Let's did do. doubt. We did doubt that there was a path for him last week. We were uh, drinking from the cup of Schadenfreude, uh, but he eked it out. He got it, and uh, I think. I think now we're deep enough in this news cycle. Everybody was so focused on this um, that I'm not sure it like does that much to, to talk about why it happened. Um, but I do think one of the things that struck me about the whole thing was like the, one of the reasons that last week's episode was so fun and talking about with Kevin McCarthy is like the stakes on who was speaker were so low. Like you got to just revel in the idea that like all the bad people were fighting with each other. Um, but now the bad people seem to have made up and I actually wonder, and I would like to know, there's been like everybody post game is like, well, Kevin's life is going to be much more miserable. I've said this on TV, you know, one person can do motion to vacate. There's all these rules problems. Big fights are coming, right? The stakes were low for speaker. Stakes are really high when it comes to funding Ukraine, when it comes to the debt limit. But like, is, is the fact that they had a knockdown drag out and had to and pulled those guys along and put them in their place? Because Matt Gates did kind of look like he got put in his place through the fisticuffs and all that stuff. Do you think that actually they're less likely to try another one of those, at least in the near term, uh, because of how bad that fight was? Like, is it actually, does it actually create less strife to, against all of our uh, prognostications that now it's going to be nothing but strife? Um, I, I'd be interested in JBL's take. Nobody mentioned Henry Clay, by the way, which was kind of the <sighs> oh, easy God, one. Right. Before Tip O'Neill, Langdon, no. Langdon Chevis. I'd like to shout yeah. out Langdon Chevis as well. Um, I, uh, boy, uh, we have a, we have a big fan of Chevis lingo. I don't know. I wonder, I'd like to hear from Chevis after this. I wonder if he was named after Langdon Chevis. I, I, I think that Kevin gets a little bit of a, a bump, a honeymoon, if you will, within his caucus. Um, I do, I do think that. How long does that last? I mean, a minute, I think. I, I just, I, I, I think that, that he has a little bit of runway here. Uh, the big things that we keep pointing to, that all of us keep pointing to as potential threats, the debt ceiling, Ukraine funding, that's all middle of the year stuff, right? Yes. The yeah. Debt, yeah, the right. debt fund, the Spring debt fund, I think, is summer. Uh, Ukraine yep. is funded through September. Um, you know, a, a, a emergency could happen between now and then, right? But assuming there's not an emergency, um, I, I do think he gets a little bit of runway. I think there are some easy wins. You know, we can dial up a investigation of Alejandro Mayorkas, you know, and, and hold a hearing down in uh, El Paso uh, and, you know, fly everybody down there to investigate. Uh, you know, I think that there are certain things that can be done that unite the caucus. Um, uh, apparently, 
giving Jim Jordan complete control over the budget unites the conference. There was only one one person that voted against that. Tony Gonzalez, uh, Dan Crenshaw, kind of I think was sucking his thumb and abstained, even though he was in the building to because he was upset that the terrorists won. But um, that only one actual no vote. So I think there are a lot of things that unite them. So I do think that there will be kind of like a false spring, if you will, uh, for for him um, for a little bit here. But uh, but eventually. I, I, you know, I think that the predictions will come, you know, what we expect, I think will probably come to pass, um, you know, at, at, at some stage. Yeah. I mean, that, I, I, that's almost word for word what I was going to say, which is that you know, we have a period now of like six to seven months where they don't have to do anything serious. They can do all the grandstanding and showboating that they want. Uh, they can have their Hunter Biden investigations, their investigations of the Joe Biden VP document scandal in which Joe Biden had some classified documents in his vice presidential sort of uh, what vice presidential library or whatever that, that is center that his lawyers found and then immediately called the the National Archives and the National Archives came and took possession of the next morning and how that's basically samesies. I mean, that's, you know, that's, and you people want to go after Donald Trump. That's actually, I mean, it sounds silly when you say it that way, but I think it's going to make the prosecution of Trump harder. Uh, totally. They're going to have their church committee, right? They've got a church committee coming where they're going to look at all of the, the, the FBI, deep state, et cetera, et cetera, January 6th committee. So they can do all this stuff and they can stay out of each other's lanes while they do it. They don't have to work together. And so everybody can get what they want out of the next six or seven months without coming into, any, into conflict with one another. And it's only those, those big votes which are going to be difficult. Yeah, you know, I was, doing, um, I was doing Meet the Press Daily with Chuck Todd. And Chuck Todd asked me the question. He's like, well, doesn't this diffuse the impeachment bombs? Because, you know, Beacon's not going to go for impeachment or whatever. And I was like... No, like they're still going to impeach. They're still going to try to do investigations and impeach like in certain or maybe he said investigation bombs, not impeachment bombs. Um, but in either case, like I still think they're going to do I don't think it I, I don't think any member of this so-called normal caucus or like the moderates, which, by the way, let's just take a minute and talk about how bad the framing has been on this particular thing. It's making me crazy. These are Thanks. not. The, it's not the governing wing. It's not the moderates. There are some governing people. There are a few of them among the Republicans. But what you are talking about is the MAGA establishment. You were talking about Kevin McCarthy, election denier, Marjorie Taylor Greene, lunatic, um, a whole bunch of other people who refuse to certify the election. Whole bunch of like it is. It is the the difference between the people who want to launch a bunch of performative investigations and the people who want to burn it all down. There is no governing wing and there are no, there's no moderate wing. Like I said, there are a few moderate people. Um, and because of the narrow majority, you could maybe see some of them not going for certain things like big ticket impeachment, but like they're, they'll, they'll, they'll get on board with the investigations because the overall, the caucus over the last however many cycles has gotten wildly more extreme, right? Like it is still a very extreme, yeah. it's an extreme caucus. Right now, I, this is I've also been riled up about this and had a little rant prepared um, uh, on this topic. Oh, I hope I didn't. Hope I didn't. No, 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 no. no. It's very it. similar. It actually, we're all we're all in alignment today. It's nice to all be in alignment. We got to come up with some disagreements before our very exciting road trip together next week, which I've also been. Unfortunately, we didn't get to mention that at the top because I was so annoyed about the fact that I couldn't find my fucking headphones and I wanted to strangle some people on a school tour this morning. But besides that, uh, I do want to talk about how excited I am to be in LA and Seattle. So we got to we got to awesome. we got to come up with some disagree. We got to focus on areas of tension that for, before between now and then. But here's an agreement. Um, I, not only is the con the, is there are there no moderates and, and no governing you know, wing of this conference. Like the center of the conference is why is like the extreme MAGA candidates that everybody's talking about how bad they were in the Senate races, right? Like, you know, uh, I'm trying to think about like like who would be a representative example of this because like Dr. Oz and Herschel Walker were so weird, um, you know. But like, uh, uh, I'm having a senior moment. Who is the guy that ran for governor? Tim Michaels in in Wisconsin. Tim Michaels, like, in Wisconsin. Like, Tim yeah. Michaels would be just right in the meaty center. Of this conference, yeah. we got lost right. that Wisconsin governor's race. Um, you know, people talk about, and JVL mentioned this in the triad, and it was something I've been thinking about. 
because I get this all the time from my, you know, still hanging on Republican friends, but the left has gotten so crazy too. The Democrats are getting so crazy. And, 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 you know, you ask them, it's like, okay, well, what, who, what are you talking about? And, and they always bring up the same names if we're in politics, right? It's Cory Bush, Rashida Tlaib, AOC, right? Like that, like you can, we can all name them. Anna Presley, they're six. Um, By the way, stipulated. 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 There's six. But Bernie Sanders. Okay. There's six. All right. There, um, uh, but then if you just kind of like pick a random Democrat out of the air, like you just put them all in a pot and like, <laughs> like a little big bowl and you just magically like pull one up by their troll hair and just say, Hey, I'd like to speak to you. Like you get a person who's kind of like a human most of the time, like somewhere in the middle of the, you know, you get a Jason Crow in Colorado. You just get somebody who's just like a guy or a lady, you know, a smart person. Um, the Republican side, like before this week, Sarah, had you ever even heard of Mark Green or Jason Smith? I did not hear of Mark Green. I'm I'm so glad to know of him now, though. Yeah. So Mark Green and Jason Smith. These are not. These aren't. This isn't like the Marjorie Taylor Green, the Lauren Boebert, like the names you hear when you talk about the crazy party. These are just some guys in the middle of the conference. They get. They both get. They both won competitive <laughs> committee seats because just like the speakers race, all these committee chairmanships had like little clusterfucks. So Dan Crenshaw. You know, gets gets the boot. Sorry, Dan, because um, he was too mean to the, you know, calling him terrorists, too mean to the MAGA crowd. He gets the boot from the Homeland Security Committee that he was due. And instead, it goes to this guy, Mark Green from Tennessee. Mark Green is concerned about transvestites in the military. He likes to use the word transvestite. Mm. It's a key, key term that he uses. Uh, Obama, Muslim. Non-citizen. Obama's a non-citizen. Where he was deeply concerned about the bathrooms. Just um, asking questions. You know, you know, yeah. I mean, this dude is a lunatic. Like this, this guy would have just been laughed out of one of these swing state Senate races, right? Um, he's now the head of the Homeland Security Committee. You know, then we get Adrian Smith, who's like a like on the normalish end of the Republican caucus. He gets booted out of the Ways and Means in favor of Jason Smith, election denier, likes to call women females for some reason. Like, I, and that's the type of... Probably because he respects them so much. Yeah, voted against the election, right? So, like, this is now, this is the Ways and Means chair is, is someone that voted, to, and the speaker, is someone that voted to overturn the election. Like, that's just the dead center of the conference is these people that are lunatics. And, and, and I think that is a meaningful difference. In addition to the fact that when you start trying to get to five, and I was texting with some Dem House people, moderate Dem House people, and they were hopeful, God love them, that they would get to five on the rules. And I was just like, I, I don't know if you guys, are you guys talking to the people on the other side? I was hopeful that they were right and I was wrong. And that there were these secret normies out there who are going to come forward. So I was like, I don't think they exist. We all say the same names. Don Bacon, Fitzpatrick or Fitzgerald, whatever it is in Pennsylvania. Fitzpatrick. Fitzpatrick, right? Now this Tony Gonzalez. The two guy. impeachers. What? The two the impeachers. The two impeachers that are left. Right. Like... This guy, Lawler, seems pretty normal out of New York, right? We all say the same view. That's six. So you, you have to get all of them. They end up only getting one. They get one, right, to vote against this rules package that lets Jim Jordan negotiate, you know, the full faith and credit of the United States. I, 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 that's just the reality of where things are. And I think that, that, that commentators like your friend Chuck Todd are just a little slow to, like, recognize the churn that has happened in the House because the more familiar names in the Senate, this churn has been slower in the Senate, right? It's a six-year term. You know, you got your Susans and your Mitts and stuff still in there. The churn is slower. The House, like, the churn has happened. I I, I got to disagree with you there. Here, right. point of disagreement, Timothy. Thank I love that. Uh, I think that... The media has a very difficult time getting itself to accurately characterize what the median House Republican conference member is these days because it's too crazy. And to say it makes it sound like you're an activist. Right. Right. Yeah. This is because the truth is the two conferences are mirror images of one another. When the Democratic side, you can name the 11 crazies. And on the Republican yes. side, you can name the 11 normies. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's like, that's. <laughs> And, you know, like, that's not how both sides journalism works, right? I mean, both sides journalism just sort of takes everything as given. Like, you have a dispute. You have some people who want to raise the debt ceiling and some people who don't. And we let both sides have their say in our reported piece. And that's... 
I don't know, man. I don't want to sound like Jay Rosen or anything, but that's that's a problem for accurately characterizing reality. Yeah, I mean, there are some more Republicans than the ones we've... I mean, the problem is, is like, the Nancy Mace, or um, what's his name from Wisconsin, who, who introed Kevin... Um, Gallagher. Mike Gallagher. Gallagher. Yeah, Gallagher. Pat McHenry. Or, or Crenshaw. Line. Like, there actually are these people, but what we know about these people is that... And I think it's it was part of our, our schadenfreude soup, right? Which is... You guys have tolerated this. Like, Dan Crenshaw, are you sad now? Are you sad that you've made excuses for <laughs> Donald Trump and you've, you know, talked about how the Democrats are always worse and, and uh, it's definitely not a problem with your own caucus? And are you upset now that so many of these people are crazy? Nancy Mace, are you upset uh, that these guys are immediately going to come out and try to talk about banning abortion? Um, and and you, as you say, you're like, you're, a, you're she, she, she had this, like, like I was listening to her talk about, she was a, a, a victim of sexual assault herself. She does, she, you know, she wants the exceptions for rape and sex life of a mother, thinks it's crazy. She's like, did you guys not see what happened in the midterms? I'm like, oh, well, don't you sound normal, Nancy Mace. But then I remember that it was so recently that when she took some criticism in her primary, she ran to Trump Tower to take selfie videos <laughs> in front of Trump Tower, announcing how Donald Trump was the greatest. Uh, so we wouldn't be too mad at her. And so like, uh, they they would be normal if the environment allowed them to be normal, but because they're like human weather vanes and the wind has been blowing the other direction, they don't sound, they only sound normal sometimes. I agree. And to that extent, there's probably, if you include the secret normals, you can get up to like 60. But still in a 218 person conference, the dead center of it right. is like Jason Smith, who like voted no. against the election. No, I agree. Or, I'm not disagreeing. No. I'm just, right, yeah, yeah, no, I, okay, no, I don't no, want to no. overstate it. Yeah, because I think, um, fair. It's a fair. I've, I've here's here's one the, thing just sorry, go really yeah. quick about the Nancy Maces of the world and, and, and how they're in a little bit of a political pickle in, in the same way that Biden was. Now, Biden navigated this. But, you know, there, there was some argument. I think it, it turned out to work out for him um, because because Manchin played ball. I think more than people thought might not end up working out for Manchin in two years. But, like you could have made an argument that Biden would have been better off politically the last two years to have had a 51-49 Senate. Right. Wouldn't have been as much pressure You know, from the left, had a lot of excuses. You know what I mean? Like now you got to do this sort of thing. There's like this inverse issue that now the Republicans, the Republicans like Nancy Mace have in the House were like they might have been better off having a two person Nancy Pelosi majority because then, you know, on, on bills that are already going to pass. You know, the gay marriage bill, you know, you get 50, whatever it was, 47 Republicans, right? Uh, which is a pretty good, met, you know, th thumbnail sketch of who the closet normals are, right? Like on something like that, you get whatever it was, 47. So you can vote for that because it's like, well, you know, no real risk here. You know, in my district, this is going to be popular. I can do this. All right. Now the problem is you can't do that with Kevin in charge because Kevin cannot pass a bill that is just Nancy Mace and Dan Crenshaw and the six regulars plus 200, 212 Democrats, right. right? Because now he'd cut this deal where they'll throw him overboard, right? So now it makes it a lot harder for these people, the Nancy Maces of the world, to like get, just get separation from the crazy caucus. They all have been lockstep with them. Like in order to get separation now, rather than picking a few friendly issues to side with Democrats on, they have to tell Republicans, no, sorry, I'm going to vote against you on that one. And and then and then you start to and then you become Dan, you know, you, you get put in the corner. People don't like you. Fox makes fun of you. You're voting to abstain. You know, you're sad about things. Uh, and so I, I, I think that they're in a bit of a there's not going to be a ton of opportunity for for those 15 Biden district Republicans to get distance in this in this in this uh, next two years. I have a question for the two of you. Do you have any guesses as to what the Republican majority is going to want to do vis-a-vis -vis abortion? They've got a bunch of show votes scheduled. I think of the first 12, 12 votes, three of them are going to be about abortion uh, Ross Douthat, we'll talk about this later, thinks that it's entirely possible they're going to vote to really expand help for families <laughs> and for mothers as part of their pro pro life package. Mm -hmm. I'm a little, I got to say, I'm a little skeptical that that's where their head's at. Um, but on the other hand, there is a huge expectation among the Republican base that they're going to go out there fighting. And I don't know, like th this would be the weird on this is the, the one place where before we get to those three big votes, 
McCarthy, I think, has a danger moment where he has to figure out how does he how does he keep the conference from taking a vote that's going to like absolutely crush the party two years from now versus like keeping some of his people who are in R plus 40 districts happy. I don't, yeah, I mean, we saw this with Lindsey Graham, right? Last time, you know, where they went, you know, you get, you, you're going to get somebody that's going to get out ahead and want to vote on a, a, a federal ban, you know, at some level. The, the Republicans in the past um, have demonstrated you know, have been more adept at at, at message at pointless message votes than Democrats um, have been. Um, uh, Democrats did a little bit better at that uh, at the end of the last cycle uh, or the end of the last two years going into the midterms. Um, uh, and so, I, you know, I, I do think that they'll probably do some third term bans, some stuff of that nature. But but now, the, again, with such a narrow majority, you know, only a small group of people will be able to put a lot of pressure you know, on McCarthy to want to want to go further and push the envelope on it. So I don't I, I think what it's safe to say is that they're not going to do kind of like something that they think might get some Dem votes, you know, maybe a package right. that uh, right. bans partial birth abortion, but also gives help for moms and like, you know, something that might be able to get some Senate. Like that's not uh, that's not where. No, I don't think they can do that. I, I don't think no. the 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 base would let them do something like that. I think they want like real restrictions. They want to fight. Right. Yeah. This is, I mean, this to me is just Tim's point again about like the trouble that'll cause for the Nancy Maces. And I think this is where Kevin McCarthy, you know, like a strong speaker, like a Nancy Pelosi would do whatever she could to protect her vulnerable members from those tough sort of votes. And Kevin McCarthy's not going to do that. And this is also, it, it brings up the point that I think is the most interesting around this motion to vacate, where any member can really like go after him. What is the reason that they, what is the thing that they didn't trust him on? Why did they feel like they needed to have control besides they're trying to wrest concessions from this guy? The main thing that they wanted was to keep him from cutting deals with Democrats. That is what that's about, yep. right? And so the... His maneuver room now is like all within his own caucus. Like he doesn't have a lot of opportunity to go across the aisle because that's the whole thing Chaos Caucus wanted to keep him from being able to do, to pull. They didn't want him to be able to pull that lever. Um, and that's where all like the decent stuff is, right? And so They don't and, want I, any legislation passed. Well, this is what I was going right. to say. Like I mean, the thing yeah. is, is like, what did they, what did they promise their constituents when they were campaigning? investigations mostly like woke stuff they're going to get not have the irs agents um which by the way i don't did you see the cbo scored that irs agent thing and it's going to raise the deficit by like i don't remember the number 115 million or something like it or billion it's like a net a net increase because we're not collecting taxes from you know big corporations like the idea that these irs agents were just going to go around like busting the little guy like i don't know about the rest of you it took me forever to get my return like they have to do the job of people's taxes. Uh, I think this was such a weird hill to die on. Well, like they, Republicans the care deeply about debt and deficits as well, I, soon as they're done with the IRS agent repeal. <laughs> then they, they, they weren't ready yet. I know. I know you do. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't. I don't. To just be honest, in a in a different world, right? In a, a more, you know, babe in the woods ish, Tim. You, you might have been able to get me on the IRS agent thing. <laughs> we don't really need that many more IRS agents. Well, we could target a little more. But the more you look into it, um, you know, it's like, well, there's a lot of the, it's turnover, right? Like this is funding the IRS going for 10 years. And, and so, you know, we're, you're replacing a lot of existing folks. I, I think that the Democrats probably could have done, done a better job of, of messaging it. I mean, we don't, I'm not really, I don't think we need any additional audits on, you know, people, people in the, you know, second quintile, third quintile, um, you know, scraping an extra couple grand out of those folks. But, um, but it, you can see why that resonates, right, as a message, you know, because totally. it's like, oh, you know, it, it is, it's tied into the deep state stuff, right? It's like, it's all, it's all united, right? Which is like, if you're chip, you're like, all I'm, all I'm saying is, I'm not letting these fucking liberal elites do anything. I'm not letting them do anything. They're not right. going to audit you. They're not going to collect your taxes. I'm going to be on their ass every time they let, a, you know, another asylee across the border. We're not going to let them investigate Mr. Trump. You know, we're going to go look into the FBI. We're going to look into the DOJ. But like that. So that is 
that is what their agenda is, right? Which is, stop, it, it's not like, oh, you know, we want to reform the IRS or the tax code in order to help maximize right. your earnings. It's not that, right? And so to that extent, these guys don't need to do anything. And I think that it's really part and parcel with kind of the investigation agenda. Yeah, I agree. Uh, all right, we got to move along a little bit. George Santos is in Congress. He's running Love away that. from people all through the halls. Uh, I guess the they're trying to maybe make it try to open up the ethical stuff, not be such sticklers as to every I being dotted and every T being crossed. Do we have any? Is there anything else to say about this other than like we'll find out if he committed crime or not? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, I do think it's funny to me how Marjorie Taylor Greene and Santos already seem to have like found each other a little bit. And if past is prologue, uh, we can expect George Santos to be the key to the next speaker vote. Uh, (laughs) That he will be like at the center. He will be needed in order to give credibility to the kleptomania uh, like... What's it? What is it called when you lie all the time? Uh, uh, isn't there like a uh, pathological liar? Pathological, pathological liar, liar caucus. Yeah. yeah, you gotta pacify those guys. Um, can, can I, I say I'm really zag a little bit on Santos? Hold on, one second. I just want to. I want to say I'm actually really impressed with with Marge Taylor Green. Uh, she has demonstrated over the last year that she is not content to be a grifter that she wants to be a player and that she wants to, to move up in Republican politics and she wants to be somebody and do something. And she is doing all of the stuff, all of the little hard stuff like cozy, you know, biting down on a stick and helping Kev Bo get his speakership and she running. looks perfectly thrilled about it. Yeah. She does not look like it's causing her heartburn. She, she is all in. She is assembling a power block within Congress that will belong to her and I did not believe that she had that in her, but it's impressive. And I think it suggests that she is actually around for the long haul. I don't think she is a, I think Lauren Boebert is probably gone after, after this. I, I would be shocked if Republicans in her district don't force her out and, uh, and beat her in a primary. She was super weak last time. She bucked the, bucked the herd this time. I think that she will not survive but i think marge is here for reals yeah our friend robert vapor's been on this on marge he sniffed out her skill um and and it was a key part of his book um i'm also i'm impressed with marge and santos so we're gonna zag right now i for different reasons i just the the just the level of sociopathy and fortitude to just sit there for a week you know, some people were saying that, like, oh, George Santos was the biggest beneficiary of this Kevin drama because it made, gave people other things to talk about besides him. I was like, I don't know. I think it might have helped George Santos to not have C-SPAN cameras running on his face 24-7. <laughs> I mean, like, dude, it just has to kind of sit there, have no friends, pretend to make jokes. And did you see the one image of him showing him, showing people the meme of Kevin McCarthy? It was, it was going around. It was like it was like a speaker, speaker. Kevin McCarthy, it's like where you check all the flat uh, oh, yeah, yeah, lights, yeah. Uh-huh. you know, and it's like you don't check Kevin. He was he was trying to make some friends, like the awkward kid on the bus. And, um, and you know, he's not cracking. Dude is not cracking. He managed to get to Congress, making a completely fraudulent story. Everything about his life is a lie. And uh, and he's managing to just stick with it. And I, I kind of, I just, apl- I, game recognizes game on that front is all I'm saying. Like, like he's gonna, he is skilled and I don't, I, I hope that he gets kicked out of Congress. I think it's a, it's a, it's a poor reflection on our system that he's there and our, on our, on the people of this country and on the opposition research efforts by the Democrats and on the morals of the Republicans that work for him. But I mean, dude. Like, dude is riding this out. Like, a weaker person would just be like, you know what? I, I don't, I don't, I don't I need can't this. do this. But he right. is comfortable yeah. in the heat. He's walking over the hot coals. And uh, and I'm impressed with that. I'm also impressed with Marge. And just really quick on Marge. Matt Gates. I would add. I, I would love to see, like, a little heat chart of, like, Newsmax viewers, fave unfaves on various people. And I think that Marge is skyrocketing right now. I think that I, I do think that Gates kind of flexes muscles. I don't think he had a bad week, but 
I, I think that if you just look at who, both inside and outside game, I think Marge played it the best. So I, I agree with this. Uh, she And she's getting a glow up, right? Like the Fox News, in order to preserve Kevin, and Met, Mo, Mona has a great piece about this in the Bulwark today, but in order to preserve Kevin, they got to rehabilitate Marge because she's a key ally of his now. And so they can't have her be the space lasers lady. Mm-hmm. And like, Mona's got some great lines in there where, you know, you saw this Howard Kurtz doing his best to just really help her put it behind her. He's like, but you know, you did say a few things like you were a, a QAnon adherent. And she was like, that was so long ago. And you're like, that was 2018. <laughs> like, this was like, I mean, it only feels like it was 20 years ago. Yeah. Like, yeah. this is not that this is not that long ago. It was how you ran for like the Parkland shooting false flag. Like this is a full on Alex Jones figure. Uh, anti-Semitic through and through, uh, sleeping with her CrossFit instructor, like just Looney Tunes. But no, Fox News has got to rehab her. But I did actually want to say on Gates, I think Gates looks like he got spanked. I do not. Th- I don't think. I think he came out of this bad. And yeah. and there's a couple of those videos. Did you see the one where someone leans over and gets in his face and they say something to him very very close and he like can't move and he's kind of pinned in and he kind of like nods but like. How to get him to, he said never, he was flexing all over the place. No, I think he looks bad. I think he came away. And like, Wuss. I I looked at his like Twitter when he said, I've, you know, eh, we should all move on, blah, blah, blah. And like everybody, his people were like, you sell out, you know, because like you take a stand, you build your brand on that mm-hmm. and then you cave. That's bad for you. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Let, let me just make a confession to you guys. I, uh. Ooh. I much prefer Marge Green to Elise Stefanik. And one of the things I'm hoping for is for Green to overtake Elise in the conference. I hope that she comes for Elise's seat uh, in, in the leadership. In what, in what way and do so, you do you perform, prefer Marge to Elise? Because it's more pure? Because Marge means it. Say whatever you want to. Whatever you want to say about the tenets of National Socialism, at least it's an ethos. Right. And and Elise is just just pure ambition. Do you see the New York Times piece about her over the Christmas break with like literally all of her friends just saying this is insane. Like she doesn't believe any of this stuff. It's nuts what she's doing just because she wants the brass ring. And I I don't like that. I don't like I don't like phonies. I like I like people who 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 are actually believe the things they are saying. That's what we do with the bulwark. Uh, and, you know, we don't believe in Jewish space lasers. We tend to believe in other things. But uh, but Marge believes it and Elise doesn't. And it would be the perfect irony if Marge winds up coming for Elise. Saying what you believe is freeing and it's and you can sort of feel it in a person and their spirit. Um, I, so I agree with you. Just if you put away all of the consequences, I find Marjorie Taylor Greene to be a more appealing person than Elise Stefanik. Like, I don't. I don't really find either of them particularly appealing, but you know, if I had to go to St. Bart's for a weekend with one of them, I'd, I'd probably go with Marge over Elise. I think that Elise's ugliness is really kind of subsumed her, like in her ugliness of her soul. Um, and, uh, and I don't like it at all. That said, uh, we did just have to listen through four years of a, listen through, live through four years of a Donald Trump presidency. And I just, Marjorie Taylor Green, I, I don't, I don't want to risk Marjorie Taylor Greene being any number of heartbeats away from the presidency. You know, eventually, as a as a rank and file congressperson, your responsibilities aren't really that great. But at the end of the day, I don't think that you know Elise is like a you know if she was a heartbeat away from the presidency, would be a fundamental threat to our survival. Whereas Marge, Marge, on the other hand. A little bit more of a wild card on that front. So so I guess I have have mixed views on your take. Uh, Yeah, I can't. You're not going to make me choose between two different types of vile. (laughs) uh, And that's what they are. They're just, I I, I take your, but like I find Marjorie Taylor Greene to be repellent in the same way I've always found Donald Trump to be repellent, which is like on a visceral level. Mm. Um, Like ever, and and, uh, I I do think uh, there's something about knowing that that Elise Stefanik would compromise any principle for any amount of gain. Uh, That's alarming, right? You don't want somebody like that anywhere near power, but like Marjorie Taylor Greene is actually crazy. Um, And I loved hearing her say 
as she talked about QAnon and the space lasers, say, well, like many people, I was sucked into some conspiracies on the internet. That's something. Uh, so, so anything on the internet can get Marjorie Taylor Greene to believe it. Like, I think that's a problem. I think Lots that judgment. Of people is... thought Hillary was a baby eater. I mean, it was yep. on the front of magazines. It was that. Well, there's that National Enquirer that wrote about it, and a couple other ones. A lot of people and buy honestly, those. They're in the knows? front of the grocery store. Yeah. Right. How is any of us to figure out what's really true anyway? Mm -hmm. It's on the right. internet. It's on the internet. So it's I'm not going to I'm not going to assign more virtue to either of them. Um, but I think it's important to know that the two people you're talking about uh, that would be at that high level in the conference, including the the, the speaker himself, who is an election denier, uh, Steve Scalise, who's also an election denier, people who did not certify elections. Uh, and then you've got Marge and Elise. Um, I, I mean, these are all just variations on the same really horrible theme. And so um, I, I'm not describing you, well, you cannot be in a leadership position anywhere in the Republican Party unless you deny the results of the 2020 election. That's true. Did you right. see Marjorie Taylor Greene, though, did it was sort of one of the things that. Um, so so I think we, I want to talk a little bit about Trump and the role that he played as like a as like an exogenous ghost uh, over uh, presiding over this whole thing. But some of those pictures of Marjorie Taylor Greene, like waving her cell phone at people and it says like DT and it's, she's like waving it at Rosendale being like, you know, Trump wants to yell at you. Um, I watching Kevin McCarthy very specifically at the end. And I wonder when this was negotiated. Like if, if, if Trump said to Kevin, I'll back you. But when you win, first thing out of your mouth better be, Donald Trump isn't losing any altitude in the Republican Party, and I got to thank him for doing this. Because that's what old Kevin did. He didn't just say, I want to thank Donald Trump for all his help. He said, some people doubt his influence in the party, but they're wrong. Sarah, this is, you are underestimating Kevin McCarthy, because he is not very smart, but he understands those things. And I guarantee you Trump didn't need to say anything to him. Kev Bo understood exactly what he was expected to do. Sure. Okay. Right. And he, 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 he knew the first thing he had to do was uh, go tickle the pleasure centers of, uh, of Donald. Right? So do we think Trump was playing a role here? Like, does he get credit? Yeah. What do you think? I give him some credit. Don't you think, Tim? I don't, I don't think it was a call from Don. I mean, I think that if Donald Trump's, uh, lobbying mattered. Uh, it would have mattered before vote 15. Uh, I think he could have sunk in there. Um, right. Other... I mean, I, I think Trump could have, have killed the McCarthy speakership. Would you just, I mean, be, if, I mean, if Trump he decided he's going to come out hard. Extended against. the number of votes for sure. Yeah, he'd come out harder for sure. Yeah. I think that's true. I think if during that, that overnight where it wasn't clear, Kevin was like, oh, I talked to Trump and, you know, he reiterated his support for me and we were all like, did he, though? And then he had a tweet the next day. It was a very yep. forceful. Uh, I'm with him. He, he might be good, even great. Uh, and so I think that that did hold him steady. I think if Trump had come yep. out and torpedoed him and be like, it's over, Kevin. We need to look for somebody new. I do think that might have ended him. Yeah. It would have given cover to people who wanted to leave. To bail. I yeah. yeah. I think that's right. Uh, all right. Uh, did you guys... This is probably a long show. Um did you guys want to talk about my any of the the hot fire that I have been spewing in my amazing newsletter, The Triad, which people can subscribe to at thebulwark.com? I'm not sure that I could add anything to the Match Book Club uh, allegory. Uh, Did you like that, Tim? Podcast form. I think that I think that you achieved perfection in the written form when it comes to the Match Thank Book you. allegory, and I just I'd rather direct people to that. Uh, then try to, you know, adulterate it with my my own commentary. People should go go give that a read. I don't know if we can put one of those floaty link things uh, right there for the linking to that piece, but but if we can, we should. Thank you. Do you know Sebastian. how long I had to read that piece before I was like, "There's no such thing as a match throwers club." <laughs> like, what is he talking about? Because <laughs> uh, for a while, I was like, "Did there used to be match throwing clubs?" <laughs> But this sounds like an old time thing that people would do. I've seen people throw matches. Uh, and then and then I was like, aha. Once they started blowing up the gas stations, it got pretty clear to me that it was a, a very tortured, extensive metaphor. It's parable. A parable. A parable. Yes, this is what we There were that. some good fires, though. I mean, I just, you know, the cleansing fire in Chicago, really, a section I did enjoy. 
Um, I also enjoyed, I, I guess Charlie wrote on this this morning, not you, but uh, the, the match throwing parable could have extended internationally. I guess also after what we saw in Brazil this weekend, I think yeah. you could have written about how, you know, the match throwing club has now, you know, picked up South American, uh, you know, some South American adherents. Right. Why was I love Bannon yelling Sarno. about you? Why was Bannon you... yelling about me? Yeah. Uh, on the topic from the beginning, the first uh, topic, uh, he did not like my take about, or, or no, I think that it was not, he didn't like my take. He was gleeful. Bannon, we have to, there's a symbiosis, as you've heard on this podcast, between us in the Never Trump world who speak honestly about where the party is and, and the people who, who honestly like the party to be crazy, right? right? And so I think that this is a situation where I was talking about how, like, how pathetic it is that there, there were, you couldn't rustle together five governing moderates to like, try to, try to you know, uh, negotiate on the rules package on the other side. And Bannon was kind of gleefully pointing out that he called me a screaming banshee, which I thought was, I didn't, I don't really feel like that's an apt a, a metaphor for me. I don't More know. Or a pearl clutcher. I always think pearl that that's. Clutcher? Yeah, pearl clutcher would have at least, you know, been a little clever. Um, uh, but he was commenting on, on that. Uh, I, I then tried to reply to him. Now he does this on Getter, on their, on their platform, Getter which is owned by Jason Miller, who doesn't pay A.J. Delgado's child support. Uh, the, he's that, the guy that with no chin that worked for Trump. You might remember him. Mm. And so my getter account name is Pay Your Child Support, Jason. <laughs> and so I tried to reply to Bannon, but I don't think he realized it was me. You know, because mm. it doesn't say oh, Tim Miller. It just says Pay Your Child Support, Jason. So I, I, need, to figure, I need to figure out a different way to engage. On that, I forget where we were, where this conversation. JBL was going to say something about Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro. What were you going to say? Oh, I was just saying that I th I thought it was fascinating that Bolsonaro knew that he should go to the free state of Florida to hide out there while his "Don't call it a coup" was happening down in Brazil. I mean, it, I mean, in fairness, there are a lot of else? there are a lot of Brazilians in Florida. I don't know how much time you spent there, so it might not have been related to DeSantis. It may have been, but is is anybody else? at all concerned that DeSantis is rubbing up against guys like Bolsarno and uh, our Orban? Hungarian friend, Victor Orban. Like, you know, like if, if we're supposed to believe, don't worry, he's secretly a normie. He is not authoritarian, curious, all this stuff about using the power of the state to punish private industry and, and individuals and stuff. That's just an act. And now he's like literally buying off the Chris Rufos and, you know, Mark Bauer lines of the world by giving them jobs in an attempt to, which, by the way, that's the kind of thing that Trump ought to be paying attention to with his non-campaign. I mean, DeSantis is literally buying conservatism Inc. out from underneath him. Yeah. Uh, and this one nobody... thing, though, on this point with DeSantis and Bolsonaro, because this is another thing that we are free to mention that, that people don't like to mention in other, you know, other uh, Republican uh, types or, or even mainstream media types like in a, in a, in a real in a regular world in a pre-trump world like the idea of just aspirational Republican presidential candidates thrown out there like don't love what bolsonaro is doing you know not great that they're storming the capital down there in Brazil um, disagree with that you know it's the kind of thing that people that are you know back in the what Bush, you know, you know, 2000. It's like Condoleezza Rice is saying it, but nobody knew is. Nobody knew is, right? Like famously, yeah. like Bush in 99 flew people down to Austin or Midland or wherever he was, right? Who were ex subject matter experts. And like the Democrats kind of made fun of him, right? That he had to get up to speed and learn Benazir Bhutto's name and things like this. But he was trying to. And so it was the kind of thing that then the governor of Texas might have, you know, put out a little statement on. It's like troubling what is happening in Brazil, right? Or, or you know, if Bolsonaro had moved to a state would be like, you know, not really thrilled with the author authoritarian efforts nothing. nothing we stand nothing. against violence in democracies yeah, yeah. yeah but nothing. they can't do that they, they can't, can't do that right do now that. because they can't condemn it there because they can't condemn Those it here no voters. lip service not even lip service yes. to it and, and my, my point is like would it even hurt them like, like they're all so cowardly yes, yes it would hurt them. no no some if somebody if put out one tweet that's like i don't love what bolsonaro is up to right now i you know i think he should go home to brazil that, nobody's going to give a shit about that. No way. That's putting a target on your back from the entire Breitbart uh, entertainment complex. 
Because I, you know, bet you anything, those guys are making money from Bolsonaro and uh, Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro. Yeah. I, Bolsonaro. Why? Yeah. I was... Anyway, I, I just think that, and especially if you think you want a future in leadership in the Republican world, you cannot touch that stuff at all. There is no percentage in it for you. Yeah, and also like Orban, uh, the conservative movement are 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 alleged. You know, our, our friend in difficult times, Matt Schlapp. They they had CPAC in Hungary, like they brought Orban to speak. Like there is a they are Tucker's like all about Orban. Like they are they are seeking out these authoritarians to make the and so now there's a wing of the party that has to be pacified or mollified or whatever uh, that DeSantis knows and that's how you you got to choke those people off from Trump early and so he'll play footsie with them sure just Come a little to the girl free talk state here. of Florida. Been a, been a long show. Just a little girl talk, though. You mentioned our friend Matt Schlapp, and I totally agree with what you're saying on Orban, by the way, but it sparked another thought. Did you see this week that Matt Schlapp opened for Trump in Mar-a-Lago? He put on the, the penguin suit, went down to Mar-a-Lago, and gave some remarks. And I, that Did he drive like himself the thing. I don't, I, If I know anything about Donald Trump, it seems like he's a gossip you know, it, it seems like the kind of thing he probably he probably brought up, don't you think? I mean, I I, I don't know. I was intrigued. I, I guess I, I'm not. I don't really usually care about the palace intrigue about what's happening with the Cougars in Mar-a-Lago and want the you know want the eighteen anonymous quotes to Michael Bender of the New York Times about like who hates who right now inside Trump world. But I, I'd like to hear, I, I, I'd be a little bit interested in, in, in uh, what kind of chatter Trump was, Trump so had about his, about his opening act. Because do you, do you remember how the conservatism Inc. class turned Trump against uh, Josh, what's his name in Ohio? Josh Mandel. Mandel in Ohio, yeah. right? Yeah. They did, they, they did, Trump did not want to endorse J.D. Vance, but the, he got turned off because they were like, you know, Weird the sex other stuff. guys into some weird sex stuff. And yeah. Trump like, Ugh, pervert. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing not like not Shark Week with hookers. Not normal. <laughs> it's red not like he's watching the Gorilla Channel. Just with, to watch Shark with Week with stars. a hooker, okay? Yeah. That's what Trump likes. I am shocked that Trump didn't view the schlap stuff and think, hmm. <laughs> I think no? that's what I'm saying. I think he had to. I, maybe it was already scheduled. I'm just, I, I think that there was probably some interesting chatter at the head you know, table. I hear that, that Hungary is a good saying. place to go find yourself. If you are a conservative who is just having some feelings and, uh, you know, don't quite know how you could achieve certain sort of things, then uh, you can go to Hungary and, uh, and you know, really do some explorations. Maybe Matt Yeah, Schlapp that's funny about there. Matt Schlapp. I would say it could be. Trump, there haven't been that many, uh, any big, big wigs in the Republican Party who've wanted to hang out with Trump lately. You know, uh, this weird floor fight where he was like on the cell phone is the last, and like truthing occasionally is the most we've really seen of him and anybody paying attention to him, right? There's actually been a lot of distancing from him. So it strikes me as interesting that Matt Schlapp, in a moment of uh, distress, might be like, I should go down to Mar-a-Lago and and Trump was like, yeah, you can come because nobody else is coming. And, uh, <laughs> you know, weakness, I, right? I don't know. Like no pun found... intended. <laughs> no, that, no, no. This is intended, how right. this is how he did it the first time. It, right. He called the island of misfit toys to him. Right. Yeah. Everybody who was weak went to Trump for, literally because of their own weakness. Right. And he gathered them together into his little troll army. And, uh, you know. You people out there who think it absolutely can't happen again, I don't know that I would make that bet. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not betting he's a sure thing, but we have seen this movie before. All right, we have. Uh, good show, incredibly long show. Uh, go go read my news. It's down in the description. Go click and read it. It is a a work of staggering genius. Uh, and if you are in Seattle or Los Angeles, come hang out with us next week. It's going to be awesome. I'm really excited. Uh, and do either of you have anything else before we get out of here today? No, I'm come to LA. I'm so excited. We're gonna have so much fun in LA and Seattle. I'm, I'm I am just I'm giddy with anticipation. And one other thing, really quick: if you are going to a school tour and you're a parent, mm-hmm. 
You get two mm -hmm. questions. Okay, you get two or three questions. All right, that's it. Okay, have some respect for the rest of the, for the rest of the group. This seems unrelated. To the <laughs> it's just something that's been on my mind today. I was on a two-hour-long <laughs> school tour where the parents were asking people how they decide the the songs for the for the class. Music. Oh, this isn't even like a college tour. This is for like six-year-olds. <laughs> Kindergarten. 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 Uh... Kindergarten. The questions are: Do they learn their letters? Do they learn their numbers? Is the teacher nice? Yeah, great. <laughs> Kindergarten. That is not what I experienced today. That's all. What is your well, I'm not excited about school like? choice. I am excited about LA. That was my Are final Are you thought. weighting their grades? Uh, class rank. Where do your kindergartners go on to? Can I yeah. have a list of the, the first grades that they are accepted to after <laughs> this <laughs> kindergarten, please? <laughs> what is your syllabus? When do you start them on the ancient Greek? <laughs> Exactly. Bye. Bye. Bye.